some of my videos so that I don't run out of something to say while I am attempting to hold space for um, conversation and interesting topics with people who, who follow me on Instagram. Today, what I'm going to do is pick a random, well, I've already done it, but what I have done is pick a random pest organism to sort of talk about, essentially. And, hey, Easy Wind, cool, good for you to show up, appreciate it. We've got um, Bamesia tabasi, which is the um, the silverleaf whitefly, and I'm going to be talking about it Specifically, I'm going to be talking about Bamesia tabasi Q biotype. Um, and I'm going to start with this uh, uh, Journal of Economic Entomology Research Report. Uh, the abstract says, and I'm just going to read it verbatim, that uh, after the 2004 discovery of Bamesia tabasi Q biotype in the United States, there was a vital need to determine the geographical and host distribution as well as its interaction with the resident B biotype because of its innate ability to rapidly develop high-level insecticide resistance that persists in the absence of exposure. As part of a coordinated countrywide effort, an extensive survey of Bumisia tabasi biotypes was conducted in North America. With the cooperation of growers, industry, local, state, and federal agencies to monitor the introduction and distribution of the Q biotype. The biotype status of submitted Bamesia tabasi samples was determined either by poly uh, polymerase chain reaction amplification and sequencing of a mitochondrial cytochrome oxidase 1 small subunit gene fragment and characterization of 2 biotype discriminating. I'm not going to get into all of that. Basically, they used genetic sequencing to assess whether or not the silverleaf white fly was indeed a Q biotype or a B biotype or one of many other biotypes of Bamesia tabasi. However, interesting to note that this research report was done in, well, it was published in 2012. And I personally participated in part of the, um, I guess you could say some of the, uh, the, the, uh, sampling of Bamesia tabasi, not necessarily in this research report, but in a different one who is, uh, who is for somebody who is one of the authors of this research report. And it was kind of cool. So I'm in San Diego, and I'm noticing that we have Bamesia tabasi in this greenhouse. And I just happened to know that um, one of the people who is the author of this study went, uh, they live in Florida, um, and they were looking for samples of Bamesia tabasi anywhere in the continental United States. I think actually Hawaii and Alaska were included as well. Um, so being an ornamental horticulture, I thought this would be really helpful. So I took a bunch of, sa I said that, yes, we found Bamesia. They sent over some sample vials. I put the sample vials in, or I put the Bamesia in the sample vials, and then I sent them back. And what would, <laughs> what do you know? A hundred percent of the samples came back Q biotype positive. Um, oh yeah. So in, I didn't mention what was in the greenhouse, but these were Gerbera daisies. Uh, crazy twenty four o g was asking, uh, what were they growing? This was uh, Gerbera daisies that they were growing, and they had Bamesia tabasi, which is a pretty common horticultural pest. It's the silver leaf white fly, and I'm talking on this research report, um, a uh, an effort to take the Bamesia tabasi samples, and um, and, and see whether or not they were all Q-biotype or which ones from which part of the United States were Q-biotype. OG Kush, is that what you were saying? <laughs> cool. So, um, yeah. So, but, so in my, in my story, in my example, my interaction with this, um, is small, but, uh, it gave me an, an understanding of just how desperate the situation was for the Q-biotype sort of um, infestation, in the United States at least. And apparently, there's a map on this research report, and I don't know if I'll be able to show it to you adequately, but I can describe it. Ah, here we go. Yeah. So, um, 
in California and Florida, um, the Q1, Q2, and Q3 biotypes were detected. Um, but honestly, all the, a lot of the states were, oh, you grow Gerber daisies. Well, that's pretty cool. <laughs> so this will be relevant to you then. Um, so Canada, which they just have as a giant block here, Canada, New York, Delaware, Maine, um, Pennsylvania, uh, Washington, I already mentioned California, I believe, Oregon, uh, Nevada, or no, not Nevada, um, Arizona, Texas, New Hampshire, uh, South Carolina, yeah, those were all um, Q biotype areas, apparently. And so in the abstract, they mentioned something. The whole reason why people are worried about Q biotype is because Q biotype is incredibly resistant to pesticides, to insecticidal agents meant to control it. And that's a big problem in ornamental greenhouses because a lot of ornamental greenhouses are... Uh, reliant on chemical agents, somewhat noxious chemical agents at that, um, because they are, uh, I mean, they don't have to worry about people eating the flowers necessarily. And I'm not saying that's a good reason, not at all. Um, but it is sort of a, like, obviously there's an economic or an ecological, um, you know, cost-benefit analysis to be made for those kinds of uh, chemical agents, particularly some of the more noxious ones like imidacloprid and um, abamectin, which are very well known in the cannabis space as being not something you want to mess with, for example. So anyways, um, like for example, at the greenhouse that I was working with, um, when these samples were taken out, they use biocontrol agents quite a bit. In fact, um, one of the greenhouse workers recently went to Carpinteria to figure out or to kind of like visit with other greenhouse growers of ornamental horticulture and try to see what they're doing and sort of like trade notes, essentially. And what what was kind of interesting was that, in fact, um, those other greenhouses were just starting to use biocontrols. They had been on, on a chemical only or a spray only regiment for ever, basically, and um, the greenhouse where this cultivator was go was from, they had been using biocontrols for like seven years at this point or so, um, more or less, but really only within the last four or five years have they been particularly successful, and that's a around the time when I was um, hired to work with them because that was what I was there to do, to help them establish uh, biocontrol agents like Amblyxia swirskii, Neocelis cumarus, uh, sometimes they would use Delfastis for white fly control, for example. Um, all these are, are, the first two are predatory mites that are suppressants of uh, Bumisia tabasi. And the latter one is more effective in heavier concentrations of white fly. Um, and it's a ladybug, actually. It's a little small black ladybug called Delfastis catalinae. And... Um, there were other controls that were used, but like Bouveria bassiana, which was incredibly effective on uh, white fly. And you don't have to worry about insecticide resistance with entomopathogenic fungi, so you have that going for you. So they've been doing this for five years, seven years at this point, and um, they, uh, they were very surprised that they were the only ones. And this is very recent information for them. I still work with them. And I was kind of, it, it was a point of pride to me because, um, these people were, uh, really deserving of their, um, of their title, their, their, um, I don't know how to put it other way, any other way than they were, they were pioneers. They were pioneers in their, um, in the, in their discipline and all of their other contemporaries in California particularly in Carpinteria, were not, um, uh, they were not pioneering biocontrols at all. They didn't see the, the, the need for it. They felt like it was particularly expensive, probably. Uh, but this greenhouse was able to, so that's pretty cool. 
But um, enough about them. Um, the Bamesia tabasi is the silver leaf white fly. It's a generalist and it's found on a whole bunch of plants. It's found on cannabis, it's found on gerbera, um, obviously it's on roses sometimes, it's found on um, uh, tobacco, I believe, uh, and many other pl tomato, uh, most solanaceous crops, in fact. Although it's, it's interesting to consider the different host types because Bamesia tabasi, um, just like a lot of pests, have preferences for different plants. And what I mean when I say preference is not like it's a, it's a cogent, cognizant preference necessarily, but more that uh, some pests do worse on certain plants and do better on other plants. And for solanaceous plants, uh, they, can do, they often do a lot worse. And in whiteflies' uh, case, that's, that's, that is the case. Thrips is the same way. Western flower thrips do way better on cucumber, for example, than they do on, like, peppers, capsicum peppers. And there's probably a lot to do with um, the, uh, the chemical constituency is in the leaves. Um, people who don't know might not, might not realize this, but, like, you're not supposed to eat the leaves of solanaceous crops. That means don't eat tomato leaves. Don't eat pepper leaves, don't eat potato leaves. Um, they are not uh, great for you to eat. And, uh, yeah, so so the white fly and the western flower thrips don't do as well on those crops for that reason. Um, and with regards to uh, other plants that are a little bit less noxious in the leaves, they do better. Cucumber is a good example, uh, but it varies between pests. And for Gerbera, they're not really that noxious, so um, you can see a pretty good population of whitefly bloom and blossom if they uh, are left to do so. That's one reason why crop scouting is so important. If you have, um, let's say you have five acres of plants in greenhouses, then you have to have somebody who can go and um, scout all that area. Maybe not every single plant, but they have to have some sort of a scouting regimen wherein they can assess the, uh, the, the, the pest pressure. And if you don't do that, your small pest problem becomes a large pest problem, and then it costs a lot more money and yield, potentially, to solve it. I'm getting a, a, a question here uh, from Sunday Trucks. Do biocontrol agents leave materials on plants while working? Uh, poop or eggs of them. Cannabis in particular. Yeah, absolutely. And so do pests. So do pests. Um, and it's like, not a problem. I know that's a contentious answer, but it isn't. Um, and I'll tell you why. Because it's often postulated by people, maybe not super often, but I've heard a lot of people ask a similar question to you. And essentially make the point that they should um, not use the biocontrols because they might have frass, which is the technical term for insect poop, or eggs, or exoskeletons, or something like that. Um, which is sort of ridiculous because um, pests do the same thing and nobody ever asks people to dispense of their product if they have. Uh, pest exuvia or exoskeletons or pest eggs or pest frass. It's only if the beneficials are used because people are thinking about the beneficial because it's a, it's a conscious use and they're not thinking about the pest because most people don't understand bug physiology, which is fine. That's why people like myself and other people like ASP insects who just joined here. Hello, ASP. Um, you know, they understand the physiology and how you're basically never going to not have that. Um, I don't want to sound flippant or like super dismissive in an insulting way. Um, and I know that wasn't the question that you were asking, so there's no negativity um, uh, targeting you when I, when I say this. It's just that it's sort of funny to me that people make this sort of assessment with regards to 
beneficials, but they never pay pests the same mind. And I think that a lot of it's because people um, just don't realize that they're all kind of like that. Um, Biocontrol agents like fungi and bacteria are also going to be on your plants and uh, non-biocontrol agents that are fungi and bacteria are often going to be on your plants too. And in cannabis in particular, I know that there's the, um, the coliform tests and microbial tests and things like that. So there is, there is that, um, there is, there is that aspect, but it is true. It's definitely true. It's, um, it's a reality of cultivation and a reality of agriculture. Um, but it's not something we should be afraid of or be, or be worried about. Um, I think that it's important to know and this is important to note. And I think that, um, not doing that is doing somebody a disservice because they might think that um, they're getting this, I guess you could say, like, clean room level product when they're really not. And I think it's really important to to meet out that expectation. And when I say meet out, I don't mean to insult anybody by explaining it, but I mean M-E-T-E, meet it out, like, with a hammer. It should be tempered people should understand and realize that agricultural products are, you know, a lot more dirty than perhaps people realize. And that's not a, a good or a bad thing. It's just a thing. But it's a good point. You're very welcome. I hope that uh, <laughs> you're thanking me for the quality of the explanation. I appreciate that you took it as a quality explanation and not me haranguing you for three or four minutes about people who are not you asking about that sort of a question and getting upset about it. Uh, appreciate that more than you probably appreciate me explaining. <laughs> but, uh, I was talking about Bamesia Tabasi, but mostly I was talking about Bamesia Tabasi as a, as a placeholder. Now that I have like, you know, a, a grand total of nine or 10 people uniquely watching the stream. If any of you have questions, I'd be happy to entertain them. That's kind of why I'm holding this space. But is there something cool for me to articulate about this research report? For those who are just coming in, um, I'm talking about a research report regarding Bamesia tabasi and also taking questions about it and other things related to integrated pest management with regards to um, pests and disease and plant physiology and that sort of thing. I was actually um, uh, just made aware that one of my co-workers, I suppose you could say, went up to Carpinteria to assess other greenhouses and how they function and was very surprised to find out that only his greenhouse in California, that he well, he went up to Carpinteria in, in San Diego, um was uh, using biocontrols, which is kind of cool. Plant-Based Mind says, where's the weed at? Well, not here. I have the tea. Where's the tea at? The tea's right here. Tia Guan Yin, my favorite. Um, actually, that's kind of a... It, it makes me think about the, uh, the fact that me living in San Diego... Um, there's not a whole lot of cultivation up until recently going on, um, which is sort of unfortunate, but I understand sort of the politics and everything that kind of goes along with that. Um, where's the tea at? Yeah. <laughs> and, um, it's like, it's sort of unfortunate because San Diego already is a pretty expensive place to live and a pretty expensive place to buy things in. There's a lot of taxes in California in general. Um, and I wouldn't mind so much, not to get a little political, but I wouldn't mind so much if, like, I feel like more infrastructure, like, development and, like, remediation would be nice. I don't see it. I have no idea if it's really just not happening or if I just... Or if it's just too much, you know, all the time. I'm not in a government position to find out. And I haven't done any, any real research on the subject. But um, I wouldn't mind all the taxes if, like, it felt like it actually went to what they're supposed to go and do. But, um, but that's how it is, I suppose. Where was I going with that? 
Oh yeah, cannabis. So like necessarily in a place where things are really expensive and highly taxed, California and, and San Diego is the same way. I'm not so sure how many people who are watching are from California. If you are from California, let me know in the uh, comments below because I'd like to know and know if I'm just preaching to the choir or if I'm talking about something interesting to somebody who's out of state. I had somebody on recently from Nova Scotia, which was pretty cool. And I've had people from um, uh, India contact me on YouTube. Apparently my YouTube channel is sort of popular in India, which is not surprising. I mentioned that in my previous video. Biz Factories from Colorado. Uh, Cali from, uh, all right. Yeah, there we go. Darcy Dabs, right. Darcy Dabs was from Nova Scotia, so definitely represent there. So it's kind of cool to like have this sort of uh, international conversation with people. Um, so that's, that's kind of neat. I, I really value that. Because at the end of the day, I'm not a very big, like, like, you know, keep all the information here and sit and safe and sacred and don't let anyone else find out. Like if, 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 if people are going to be successful at growing food and if we're going to have the next generation, well, here's a topic we could talk about. Bermuda, Fulfill, what is that? What is your name? Full, full, fullish farmer. I like that name. F Florida, born in San Diego, a spin sex for sure. So cool. So, so quite a spread of people, but definitely people from California. Um, yeah, I, I think that's so like, okay. Chip the Ripper 01 says, or asks, what's the best way to get rid of fungus gnats and how would I create an environment to keep them away? Oh, that's a good question. I just did a video on fungus gnats, on Bredesia uh, genus, fungus gnats, which are the fungus gnats that most people interact with in a cultivation setting. And you can go check out that video on my YouTube channel, Xenthanol, and... Um, that's spelled Z-E-N-T-H-A-N-O-L, Zen, then all like Zen, like Zen Buddhism or something like that. Anyways, um, but I'll also answer your question here. BTI? What do you mean, BTI? Oh, I see, BTI, uh, Bacillus thuringiensis. Okay, so there's somebody here talking about Bacillus thuringiensis, that's good. Um, that's a good example of something that somebody could use for fungus gnat control. But keeping them out is definitely what's called a cultural control and integrated pest management. That's how you do things, basically. And what you could try to do is um, just like, even if you just have like a grow tent or I don't know what scale we're talking about. So like the advice kind of changes whether or not you're uh, growing in a tent or growing on a greenhouse or doing something like that. And... Um, Honestly, it'll depend on your resources as well. Um, in the video, I mentioned that um, a lot of people seem to think that diatomaceous, diatomaceous earth is helpful for fungus gnats if you top dress it on the soil. But there's at least two research reports uh, by, um, by Dr. Cloyd, who's a, a really respected entomologist, in my opinion, and somebody I respect quite a bit, who pretty much said that diatomaceous earth does not work under laboratory conditions. So, um, take that as a, as a, as a rebuke of the, um, diatomaceous earth sort of, uh, advice that people like to give out. General Mombi says about a decade ago, a species of South American whitefly was accidentally introduced to South Florida via a cargo ship. This whitefly seemed to specifically destroy Benjamin Bush type ficus plants. Interesting. That's that could be Bamesia tabasi Q type or B type or one of the well, there are no actually besides Q biotype and possibly a couple of others, the like alphabetical list of uh biotypes that were associated with Bamesia tabasi are no longer considered valid or there's uh great evidence to the contrary essentially. And people have been using the word biotype a little bit incorrectly. And just so I don't lose people on what the hell biotype actually means, just think of it as like, um, oh, I shouldn't use the word race because race means something different also in like zoology. So what I mean to say is that um, 
uh, biotype is like cultivar of plant, kind of just a special population that has a specific or multiple specific characteristics or traits. Um, yeah, so uh, do you think it was it was the beneficial to introduce white fly predators to combat this problem? Yeah, probably. Probably so, because white fly can get everywhere and... Um, uh, especially white fly being, um, I, I believe it's thought to be native to the tropics or, or no, was it Asia? I don't want to miss, I don't want to give you guys false information, but I have a Bemisia Tabasi video as well. And you can check that out. And I'm pretty sure I mentioned what it's native to, but I forget off the top of my head, but I would say that, yes, it's probably very important to release predators for that in like greenhouses and things like that. And also do surveys. In an ideal word world, you would do survey switch, uh, sweeps and try to figure out the extent of the infestation in uh, non-commercial sectors. But I don't know how many people or how well-funded the resources are for that kind of a thing. Back to fungus gnats, though. So for those patiently waiting for the fungus gnat advice, um, diatomaceous earth isn't a good po good isn't a good uh, control or preventative measure. Um, hypoaspis or stradiolalaps are a good example of biocontrol agents for fungus gnats, although they're mostly preventative. Uh, drenching with Bouveria bassiana is a good treatment for fungus gnats as well. But to actually keep them away, you really want to control your irrigation, which is another cultural control. Certainly you could put up physical barriers, but what you can also do is just not keep the soil so, met, so wet. And I'm being presumptuous here, I'm assuming that your soil or your substrate is probably quite moist. And I say that because that's like the number one reason why people have high populations of fungus gnat larvae, uh, and then subsequently fungus gnats. They kind of hang around in the top like few inches of soil, top inch or two. So if you keep that from being super moist, you can really um, affect the fungus gnat population because they don't really dig down super deep most of the time. Uh, yeah, so hopefully that was a, a good answer to the fungus gnat thing and the white fly thing. And I appreciate the uh, the comment about the fungus gnat, or I mean about the uh, the white fly. Also appreciate the fungus gnat question, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm it's fungus or Vimesia tabasi is one of the first pest organisms I really cut my teeth on, and it was where I developed a love for Bouveria bassiana because it was so lethal and so effective. And I have multiple videos on my YouTube channel about. Um, Bouveria bassiana on whitefly. There's like evidence of the hyphae gluing the body to the leaf and then killing it from the outside in and then the inside out. It's kind of a terrible way to go, but I think that's kind of cool. It's very, um, very, uh, like alien. <laughs> um, no till is perfect for gnats to thrive, says Darcy Dabs. Like, no-till is perfect for... Okay, so you're saying that, like, by not tilling, it'll help the fungus gnats grow better, you're saying? I guess because you're not, like, destroying the first the first few uh, inches of soil or, or, or feet or foot, rather, depending on how you till. I guess that's kind of true. But then, you know, that's, that only lasts for, for, for so long, and then it might get re... Uh, repopulated, right? So you're probably not going to be tilling while the crop is still like living in the soil, right? So I don't know if that's necessarily true uh, long term, but you could certainly kill like an like a, an overwintering population potentially. But most people aren't dealing with that uh, necessarily. Uh, but every every cultivation space is a little bit different. Uh, Biz Factory says, not with stradiomites and BTI, I never see them 12 cycles in. Do you mean that uh, they're not like good? Well, you should. Oh, that's actually a good point. By 12 cycles, you mean like 12 harvests or what exactly do you mean by cycles? But if, if you mean what I think you mean, um, then yeah, you have to reapply them a lot of the time. A lot of biocontrols should be reapplied. Like Bacillus thuringiensis is not going to be um, necessarily active at the same levels um, that you need it to be uh, after one inoculation. Bouveria bassiana is the same way. 
Okay, so 12 harvests. So yeah, like 12, yeah, 12 harvests in, that's, um, depending on what plants we're talking about, that's quite a long time. That can be 12 years, or it could be um, six years, or it could be four years, or something like that. Uh, so, so definitely a good point there. Um, uh, re-inoculation and, uh, well, yeah, re-inoculation or in inundative releases that are at a set period of time is really important for biocontrols. Or what you can do is you can establish, um, you can establish the population. Depending on the organism you're working with, you might be able to, um, provide for the organism in a way such that the organism can live and subsist. And one of the ways you can do that is with pollen for certain predatory mites, like Swirskii, for example. Uh, they eat pollen. In fact, they reproduce very well on pollen. Hypoaspis and Stradio are um, also possible to establish, since you're asking. Um, but they typically eat things like fungus gnat larvae. They eat uh, mold mites, for example. If you have a really organically rich um, sort of substrate, then you very well could have that work out for your benefit. If you have springtails, they'll feed on those too. Um, but like, again, you would have to have, it's like, it's carrying capacity. It's how many, how many food organisms you have and how many predator organisms you have and how many food organisms do you need for how many predators over X amount of time, it actually gets to pretty large numbers when you really think about it. And since these organisms aren't necessarily omnivorous, you have to make sure that they're well supplied with food. And that's kind of the point that was being made earlier about uh, re-inoculation and, and having like not seeing them 12 cycles in. You must inoculate and you must inundate, which is another reason why biocontrol agents are so expensive, because People have to commit to a plan, and they have to commit to that plan with um, high regularity. And if they don't, then the uh, efficacy of that plan is severely hampered, which a lot of people don't like. It's sort of inconvenient. And for people who just care about, you know, the bottom line, it's much easier for them to just hire a sprayer and, well, not hire, but have one, and then apply the, the compound of choice one time. For a certain amount of time. And even with non-systemic pesticides and chemical agents, you still have to reapply and respray those too. So honestly, you're still you still got a problem there. I guess I look a little bit better when the when the computer light is off now that I think about it. I'm kind of washed out here, but that's okay. Um, Darcy Deb says that they have a lot of springtails. Well, excellent then you probably have a pretty good population, or you may have a population already of hypoaspis miles or stradulate labs. Uh, yeah, so. Got a leaf in there. Yeah, so biocontrol, there's actually, I'll, I'll, I'll springboard off of that point. So, um, there's two main ways to apply biocontrol agents. The first way is known as an inundative release, which is what I was saying previously. The second, the second way is inoculatively, which is the establishing that I was talking about. So in an inundative strategy, you're basically worried about taking a, a massive population and spreading it out in the crop and just using sheer numbers to uh, make the overall control more efficacious or more rapid, possibly. Because, sure, you might be able to use, like, X amount of predator organism per square meter, or you can use three times X per predator, or X predator per square meter, and maybe be done with one-third of the time. It's just simple math and logistics there, but it's also going to be maybe three times as expensive. So it depends on what you're doing. And it depends on what makes the most sense to do. Um, with regards to the inoculative release, you're more preventatively, although not always, but you're preventatively establishing the population before the pest organism is there, or you're doing it even though the pest is there in low numbers so that the population can mass sort of organically. 
And the benefit to that is that it might be a, a lot less costly and you might be able to see um, results without having to spend so much money and time and labor and effort that way. But not all predators work best in the inoculative uh, fashion. Some of them, uh, they just will starve to death if their food isn't there. So you have to take that into consideration if that's worth it to just continuously apply these organisms week after week after week. Um, especially if the pest is not ever present throughout the year, that can be sort of a lot of money. Uh, Ace Insect says that they have springtails for potential bug food. Yeah, that's right. Actually, I have a question, Ace. Do you, I forget, you, um, you do, uh, keep insects, right? I'm pretty sure. Um, feel like I shouldn't be asking that question, but I want to just make sure that that's true and I'm not thinking about somebody else. There's a bunch of people I follow on Instagram who, who, um, who keep insects either, uh, regularly as like pets or to sell or irregularly kind of like whimsically, like, like I do typically, but, um, yeah, you do. So do you, I'm curious, do you have to deal a lot with, um, like, like phoretic mites or like mites that will like, uh, maybe not be parasitic or, um, not even like mutualistic, but just kind of like associated mites in your terraria, because I feel like you would have to deal with that or that we've even talked about that subject matter or maybe with somebody else. I, I'm not sure. Um, because that's sort of a thing that I've always thought would be kind of like helpful is to use hypoaspis or stradiolalaps in like the, um, I guess you could say like the, the pet bug realm or like the, um, exotic insects realm where in which you get mites and that sort of thing. Mites and mites with superworms. Yes, we have talked about that. Right. Yeah. So, okay. So that's why I'm having all these thoughts come to my mind. It's because we've already spoken about it. Good. Um, yeah, because, I mean, it's not super popular. It's more popular in different parts of the world and that sort of a thing. Um, but, like, yeah, I, I know bugs in cyberspace um, often has, uh, or not often, but I believe that there are some mites associated with some of those organisms that um, that he keeps. And I think that having predator mites and using them in terrarium or terraria might be really helpful for for. Uh, enthusiasts, I suppose. General Mombi says, every few months I find a mealybug in my mother room. They never take hold and make it an issue. But what's the lowdown on these cottony pests? Well, um, if you have cottony cushion scale, which is technically not a scale insect, that's a, or, well, it's not a uh, mealybug anyways, that's a little bit different, but if you mean the waxy, cottony mealybugs like citrus mealybug and that sort of a thing, I'd be happy to talk about it. You're going to have to tell me when to shut up. Um, mealybugs are, <clears throat> they are kind of like aphids and white flies in that they have a little, a little sucker, no, not a sucker, they have a stylet and they puncture the plant. They suck out phloem or plant sap. Small populations <clears throat> small populations are not super problematic, like you're noting. However, there are some species that are able to um, transfer disease and transmit disease. Um, so that's something to consider, but like in cannabis and perhaps other situations, it's not necessarily a big problem. Uh, but scale insects in general, specifically mealybugs in general, are um, their wax is uh, hydrophobic. So that's helpful for rain, but it's also helpful for pesticides. If you're spraying a pesticide without a surfactant for mealybugs, it might just run off their uh, waxy coat. And so using a surfactant kind of atomizes the compound and might allow uh, ingress a little bit easier. Um, they don't move a whole lot, as you're probably aware. Males are very uncommon, very rare. And females typically reproduce parthenogenetically, so they're just making a bunch of eggs. So it's really good to nip them in the bud. I'm glad that you haven't seen them as a big problem, 
but you should really, you should kill them immediately. Not that I'm assuming that you don't already do that, but for people who don't know and have never had mealybugs before, uh, you can check out my videos on both root mealybugs and citrus scale. Um, and I think those are the only two mealybug videos I've done so far. But um, yeah, they can be difficult to deal with, especially if the population is allowed to bloom out of control because sometimes they can make up to 100 or 150 or sometimes 300 eggs per individual. And if you only assume, if you even assume like, I don't know, if you assume a mortality rate of 50%, that's still a ton of, of, of babies, which are probably going to be females and they're probably going to produce another generation very quickly. So definitely, um, definitely a good point. Ace says, uh, tyrophagus or something similar, not sure how I can identify them, but they like to feed on the grain. Oh yeah, right. So you get, you're getting mold mites, which hypoaspis and stradiolae labs definitely go after. So good point on that. Um, I'm glad that you don't have them anymore. Sometimes those things sort of work themselves out. I often feel like um, like an ample or a surplus of food usually uh, encourages the population to grow rapidly, and the reduction of that food uh, can help, or uh, sort of a, a maturation of the colony can also help diminish their um, their population. Um, over vacation, the terraria seem to have dried out for a while. Oh yeah. So that can be helpful too. Um, definitely, you know, sometimes things just kind of work out that way, which is another like unsatisfactory answer. Cause if somebody asked me, well, what happened in like a, a pest cultivation or a plant cultivation situation with pests? It's like, sometimes I, I don't know. I don't know what the answer is and there's not enough data to figure it out. And it's kind of like trying to figure out like a murder mystery. It's like who who done it? Who knows? Sometimes it's a comb oftentimes it's a combination of many factors and not just one reason, just like in real life for other things. So um yeah, so as for the puffy cottony cocoon, um you should definitely send me a picture if you have one. If you can get one. Definitely send me one because that that's an important, a small but important distinction to make because cottony cushion scale, um, if it is one, then like the part of the half of the body that looks like the body is actually just a giant egg sac, um, uh, and those those things are prolific. <laughs> those things are even more prolific than a lot of mealybugs, just to be honest with you. So definitely nip them in the bud and kill them on sight if you can. Uh, let's see here. Daga Derek says, thoughts on springtails hanging out under my rock wool cubes. No problem. Don't worry about them. No biggie. Not a detriment. Not a threat. Predator mite food, as I was talking about before. Um, good question, though. People often, <clears throat> people often ask me if they're dealing with root aphids or if they're dealing with... Um, like mold mites or something like that when they ask me, oh, what is this? And it's a springtail and it's harmless. So definitely want to um, assuage you of any sort of concerns with that. And I'm getting a question here. Yeah, the superworms are more resistant to destruction or desiccation than the mites. So it looks like that worked out. Yeah, that's very possible, certainly. The mold mites definitely, um, definitely like their humidity. That's for sure. But good questions all around. Definitely appreciate the input for sure. One thing that I wish that I had for this live feed was like a timer because I know I'm only allowed to have it for an hour and I didn't time myself so I have no idea how much time I have left. But um, appreciate the input, appreciate the good questions and I'm glad that other people are getting use out of that too. That's why I do this. You're very welcome, by the way, Daga Derek. If anyone else has any other questions or topics of conversation, ASP always have uh, good questions. I really appreciate you bringing up the uh, super depressing but realistic situation that uh, befalls our insect kin because um, if they go, we are in a lot of trouble on the higher trophic level. So uh, hopefully we can turn that around for everyone. Darcy Dabs, yeah, the springtails um, excrement is going to be like mini fertilizer, and they're going to sort of bioturbate 
um, which if you don't know what bioturbation is, it's just the movement of nutrients by mini, mi microbes and other microarthropods and small insects and like ecology. So like earthworms will eat things and they'll, they'll, they'll poop, right? And so they'll leave nutrients essentially throughout the soil as they move. Springtails do the same thing, mites do the same thing, and so all those detrophores are like that. Uh, possible biocontrol use in uh, dolicopodidae. Dolicopodidae. Aren't those the, um, okay, hold on, you're predatory long leg yeah, the long legged flies, right? Um, yeah, I don't think that they're bred for it necessarily. But I definitely recognize that they are helpful for that. I think uh, there's also the hunter fly, which I think is Cotesia. I think is the genus or Coenosia. Coenosia? Yeah. Anyways, yeah. I don't think that they're bred specifically for biocontrol. However, I do recognize they are quite good at what they do, uh, which is predating on smaller, smaller little soft-bodied organisms, I think, like aphids and that sort of a thing. Um... Yeah, General Mombi, I appreciate you too. I'm glad that you appreciate the uh, the help. I'm 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 glad to help you out. Uh, Chip the Ripper one says, "Love the love what you do, man." Well, I I appreciate the comment. Appreciate the compliment. Yeah, check out the YouTube channel. Um, I don't say that like to like shamelessly plug. I say it because um, for one, that's the reason why I make the videos. I make them so that they're a reference for other people in video form taking a whole bunch of academic literature, condensing it down to the parts that are helpful for cultivators, and then shipping it out for people um, in like one to two, maybe three minute videos that are really easy to digest. I'm surprised that other people haven't done that. I mean, I guess other people have done something sort of similar, but usually they're salespeople who are trying to sell you a product. And I'm not trying to sell you a product, I'm just trying to give you information that is paywall blocks and you have to pay like hundreds of dollars to like access the research reports, which is crazy. And in my opinion, very myopic. So yeah, for those who are interested in that information, which I'm always constantly making more of and this video, this video right here is going to be on that channel as well, just like my other live videos that you can check. So if you had a question and you don't remember what I said and the live feed is ended after 24 hours, you can go back to my YouTube channel and see what I'm talking about and what you were talking about. Um, Koenosia, right, okay, cool. So thanks for fact checking me on that for the hunter fly. Uh, yeah, so you bring up a good point. Not only do they go after small flies, I'm gonna leave my computer off at this point with the monitor, I think. But, um, yeah, they'll also go after parasitic wasps, so it's kind of like, again, it's sort of neutral in that way. Go after beneficials, but also go after detrimentals, and, you know, that's life. Life doesn't play by our good versus evil battle for cultivation of plants. They're just worried about their next meal, which makes sense. Yeah, I'm also surprised. I bet that a lot of the reason why we don't see long-legged flies in use for biocontrol has a lot to do with the fact that there's probably a, a huge association with, like, ew flies. And I don't mean just, like, because we have the hunter fly, but I don't think those are bred either. Uh, but we also have the spider mite fly, but I feel like it's not very popular, honestly. So, um... I think that there's the ick factor of flies, but there also might be some like physiological uh, issue with um, with the like development of them as a biocontrol agent. I don't, I mean, but I'm just shooting in the dark. I don't really know. Um, it could be, it could be as simple as nobody has just researched them very much. Maybe we'll see something in the future, though. I'd, I'd like that. It'd be nice if we had a, a larger ratio of entomologists and horticulturalists looking at that sort of a thing. So, yeah, good questions, good points. Um, glad that people are taking interest in the content. Um, I've gotten a lot of positive... On that note, I've gotten a lot of positive uh, input from people. I've had people contribute to my Patreon, which if you don't know, I have a Patreon for um, the research that I put out. I'm trying to sort of 
essentially justify and subsidize the uh, free time efforts that I put out um, for the information. I believe that, I mean, the YouTube, the content's always going to happen. The content is always going to be free. I'm not going to like, um, I'm not going to like, uh, be stingy with the information. People ask me all the time, uh, questions and, and I, uh, would like to say that I have pretty much a 100% answer rate for questions and comments and that kind of a thing. Because at the end of the day, if it, if it helps one person, save some money or not poison themselves or something like that, then it's really worth it to me as a sort of a, a social cost that has been mitigated through that. So I really appreciate the positive input from people. I appreciate the positive support, uh, what, you know, small monetary support or just positive feelings or sharing the content that I do. It does really help out. And it's helped out a lot of other people uh, learning more information. So it's just sort of this multiplicative sort of effect. So I really appreciate other people um, taking the time to uh, appreciate me, appreciating you, and that sort of a thing. Um, yeah, I think I'll I'll make that... Uh, I'll kind of leave it there, I suppose. They say that uh, in victory, learn when to stop. And not, not, as this, not as if this is a victory, but this is probably me talking a little bit too much about other people appreciating. So for those who are just joining us, we were talking about um, integrated pest management techniques with regards to fungus gnats and whether springtails are okay or not. We talked about predatory mites. Uh, we talked about uh, particularly soil predatory mites, for example. Uh, and we've also been talking about the silverleaf whitefly, Bamesia tabasi. So, um, yeah, a big topic of conversation. If you want to find out about that and you're just joining in now, my YouTube channel is on, it's online, it's Xenthanol, and this video is going to be on it. So if you want your question answered and you want it to be on YouTube, uh, and you want that question to be there for other people to know what you've asked and for you to have a response that you can come back to, please ask me. And uh, I will be happy to help you out. Hopefully, I'll be able to help you out. Not always do I have an answer for everything, but I've, I've done pretty good. I've done pretty good, I feel like. Um, and I appreciate appreciate the love, uh, Love Lock War and General Mombi. Definitely appreciate all of you guys. But what's another good topic for IPM that I could talk about? Does anyone have a question? Something to go over or something that they're not sure about? We've also talked about Bacillus thuringiensis um, and uh, Bouveria bassiana as biocontrol agents and the different techniques of releasing biocontrol agents and the strategy that goes along with it, which is really important. A lot of people just buy the biocontrols, assume that they will work. One thing I've, I, I'm often surprised about is uh, people asking me, well, you know, I bought these ladybugs, are they going to eat my spider mites or whatever? And while there is a spider mite eating ladybug, it is not the seven spotted ladybug that a lot of people buy. It's not the, uh, you know, Asian import ladybug that people buy necessarily. Um, you should know what your biocontrols go after if you buy them because otherwise you'll have buyer's remorse. And I wouldn't want people to assume that biocontrols don't work because they didn't buy the right ones or didn't know what they were doing. Uh, one of the most unfortunate things about biocontrols in general, in my opinion anyways, um, is that a lot of people's first sort of interaction with biocontrols is with a salesperson. And just because you're a salesperson doesn't mean that you're a bad person by any stretch of the imagination at all. But it does introduce a sort of a bias that I'd like to um, evaporate out of the discussion. Because if you, I mean, in my experience, uh, people who have to toe the line and have to sell products sometimes don't like that other products are more successful or they can't talk about other products because they're competition. And that's sort of unfortunate. A lot of other people in biocontrol are, you know, super uh, transparent and they're very helpful and they know each other. And, and that's the kind of thing I'd like to establish with people. So I really appreciate that um, 
that, that there is also that contingent as well. But for people, a lot of the times that they're not aware of what biocontrols do and they just, tr they just trust what somebody says at face value because they don't have any of this physiological information. They haven't read a research report about how plants and insects interact or any of that sort of a stuff. So again, another reason why I make the content that I do because I'm not selling anything. It's all not even just my opinion, it's all academic literature for the most part backing up what I'm saying. And that's, I think, very important as well. Um, Lovelock War says, biology in the soil is key. Finding the key, definitely uh, an, an important facet of um, both biocontrol and just the cultivation of plants in general. You also go on to say, I found that if my biological life in my soil uh, then I'm not, then I'm just going to be running in, oh, so if it's not very good, you're just going to be running in circles. I, I think there's some truth to that for sure, but I mean, it's a little bit of a vague statement as to what you mean by biology, because that's literally everything besides the abiotic stuff, right? But, um, definitely having a good balance of organisms if you're trying to grow organically, um, in, in like soil substrate, for example, definitely helpful. All right, we're getting some paragraphs here. Top grade medical says slow well, slow release packets of Swirskii are there actually two spot implemented to f hold on I can't there's some typos here I have to are there actual two spotted implement implementations to feed Ambosius in packet seems like I get mites where I don't have them when I have used slow release packets. Well, you might get mold mites from sachets for uh, Swirsky eye because uh, some Swirsky eye sachets, like from Copper Biologicals, for example, they have biocontrol, uh, they have feeder mites in the sachets. They're supposed to help the, the population increase quite a bit before uh, they egress out of the sachet and ingress into the crop. And this is supposed to happen over time, multiple weeks rather. And there's a there's a special ratio of predators to feeder mites for that particular reason. As for two spot spider mites, there's no reason why they should be in the sachets. After all, not only do the Swirsky eye and the uh, cucumbers, for example, don't really go after them so much. They also have to feed on plants. So uh, since they're often not raised on plants. Um, it doesn't really make sense that you'd have two spotted. So that's probably two spotted spider mites coming in from somewhere else, and those things aren't really related exactly. Um, but it's good that you're making those observations. I hope that you're recording that information um, so that you can make those sorts of associations because pattern recognition is very important when it comes to assessing whether a treatment was good or bad. Good is not a number right? You can't just say, oh, I think it did well. Well, what does that really mean? Like, when you get down to the, like, finite details, you know, how many, you know, how many hot spots were really treated? Is the population really gone? Or is it just in remission? And there's a lower population than you're used to seeing? You know, you can't tell if you don't record that. So it's really important to take detailed notes, especially in a commercial setting. General Mombi says, uh, two months ago, I began running a hydro shop and am alarmed by the IPM of the majority of customers using, oh, using Avid, Eagle 20, and Compass. I'm trying to steer them in a better direction, but they're lazy. Yeah, a lot of people are lazy. Uh, oftentimes, we like to blame the pesticide manufacturers, but, I mean, the people who are using the pesticides incorrectly are oftentimes the people, in my opinion, who are truly at fault. Because they're the ones knowingly buying the compound that they shouldn't be buying, or they're buying the compound and, and they're allowed to use it, but they're using it irresponsibly. That's a good point. Interesting study about detritus, uh, dead insects, in mosquito larvae habitat soil affects interspecific competition. That's kind of cool. I'd like to, if you could, if you have that report, please send it to me. General Mombi says again, uh, and just want to spray, if, oh yeah, they just want to spray a few times. What can I recommend to them to use uh, that'll work swiftly? That's a safe alternative. They're lazy, to be quite honest. Predatory bugs and continuous IPM is a total turnoff to them. Oh, and I only have 30 seconds remaining, so I'm going to be very quick about that. 
Um, you're probably not going to be able to get anything that is nearly as quick as any of those compounds are. So if they're truly lazy and they really don't care if they're ambivalent or they're, um, they don't, yeah, if they're lazy, if they're ambivalent, they're probably not going to worry about it. And I'm going to leave it there. Find us on YouTube.